Welcome back, troglodytes, to the Troglies Guitar Show. <laughs> oh my goodness, guys. I've wanted to have one of these for such a long time. Pretty much as soon as I knew about them. Because they're just so freaky that you really get over this initial shock of them just being way over the top really quickly. So, what is this thing? It is a 1989 Gibson Explorer E90 Double. Let's learn about it. There is a period in Gibson history where a bunch of freaky stuff happened, and it was at the end of the Norlin era, transitioning into the Juskowitz era. So there were a few years where they had absolutely no idea what they were doing and a bunch of random stuff like this got born as well as a bunch of super strats. Now they were just too late to the party in general, none of this stuff really took off, but there's certain models like this one that have become collector's items. This was a guitar part of the Nighty series, which was basically a futuristic take on the Explorer, the Flying V, as well as the SG. Now I did do a video on a semi-what reissue of the SG-90, so I'll let you go ahead and check that one out if you'd like to learn more, but I'm just gonna strictly speak about the E-90s in this episode. This model was designed for Matthias Jobs of Scorpions. You'll also see him playing a different brand that looks very similar to this design. So this limited run birthed more designs like this. It was not his first signature Gibson though, as they also did a run with his famous stripes on an Explorer. But why does this look so freaky if it's an Explorer? Well, the body has been shrunken down 10% so it's 90% of a regular Explorer. I don't know about you guys, but that just doesn't seem right to me. 90%, this looks like it's so much smaller. But here's why this thing looks freaky. It has an extended scale. You're not 24 and three quarters, you're 25 and a half fender scale. So your neck is a little bit longer too. So put that all together, including a 24 fret, two octave scale. That's why this is kind of a freaky fish looking thing. But now let's compare it to a regular Explorer. Now you can kind of see the size difference. If you line them up just right, you can kind of see what we're talking about. It is the exact same shape. It's just a little bit shorter on all dimensions. It really is just this long neck that makes it look so weird. Now you might say, hey, Trogly, that looks like the Explorer prototype called the Futura. Kind of. It's not exactly the same. I'll throw up a side-by-side -side photo here, but essentially what's different about this is on the body right here, see how it caves in right here? On the Futura, it runs straight until it kind of meets this body edge. There's also tons of other differences here, but I think you can see them for yourselves. So while yes, they might be reminiscent of this shape, they're really not that similar. These are solid mahogany bodies with maple necks, which is kind of interesting because Gibson kind of phased out of using maple in mid 82 and they feature ebony fretboards with these split diamond inlays. The E90 came in two different variations. There's the E90 that just has one pickup, and then the E90 double that has two. But that's not the only difference. In fact, I would say the original E90 has better attributes to it. E90s will have binding along the neck, and an extra comfort cut on the back of the instrument. Whereas these E90 doubles, sure they gain this extra single coil pickup in the neck, but they lose the binding and they don't have that extra comfort carve on the back. So it's kind of an interesting trade-off. Each of these were offered with either a string through body design like this one or a Floyd Rose. The available finishes for these are Luna Silver, which is this one, Black, and White. There might be other finishes, but those are the only three I've ever seen kicking around. 
So let's talk these pickups. These were birthed in the Bill Lawrence era, kind of when you get the, the original pickups coming in. And that's exactly what these guitars came stock with. The best way to identify them is to look at the back. It should be a circuit board pickup. This type of pickup is generally found between very late 1987 through very early 1990. So I'm not 100% sure what the E90s came with after that time period. Unfortunately, the bridge pickup in this guitar appears to have been replaced as it does not have those markings. However, the neck pickup was a real treat. It looks just like the Bill Lawrence, the original pickups. It's just in a tiny little single coil form. I thought that was cool. But something each of these series has in common is a stock push-push pot. Now, this is when that technology was primitive. It's just always up. So you can't really tell if it's on or off except for by listening with your ear. And that only controls on the bridge pickup because, well, the neck pickup is a single coil. You get 11.92k ohms in the neck, and the bridge pickup will read 9.67, and when split, you've got a 4.96. Then this is also your master volume along with a master tone and a three-way toggle switch. And this is a really lightweight guitar at 7 pounds, 5.7 ounces. So overall, I love these freaky things. They're kind of a shredder's guitar. They've got that really slim 60s neck profile to them, but they really are reminiscent of a very interesting period of time for Gibson. They're very difficult to find. They're usually pretty expensive to convince somebody to sell theirs when they have it. So I wouldn't really suggest one of these if you're just looking for something to play because there are many cheaper alternatives to this. But if you're a collector, I really do believe these are a must have because there weren't a lot of these made from 1988 and I've seen them have serial numbers all the way through 1992. So now that we've learned a little bit about this freaky guitar, let's go ahead and hear how it sounds. <laughs> Thank you. 
We know how this instrument sounds, let's go ahead and review its condition. This is another one of those instruments I got out of that collection up in Michigan. So, I mean, this thing is fairly clean, but there's also some nicks and dings we need to go over. So face of the headstock here, you can see you've got some few light dings along the edges that just kind of look like scuffs. You have the beautiful prehistoric Gibson logo. I love that one. It's a little bit goofy if it's your first time seeing it, but you learn to love it. Truss rod works perfectly fine on this maple neck. You've got stock black hardware with a stock black nut. I just conditioned this ebony fretboard and polished these nice frets. You do have a little bit of fret wear. It's nothing you're gonna need to worry about though at this current time. The guitar plays very nicely and the neck profile is definitely very thin. It's very close to like what most people consider that super thin and slightly wide SG neck. You have the original neck pickup. The bridge pickup has been replaced with something that looks correct. On the case, it says one EMG. So this might be a passive early EMG, but I'm not really sure what it is. However, whenever somebody put this in, they must not have got one of the ground wires connected, so that's why you can hear that kind of humming in the background of the demo. Now you've got some light scratches and just average wear and tear. However, there are a few major dings on the top here, and let's point those out. First one right here. 
I'm guessing, as I've seen with some of this guy's other collection, is the case came down on it and went chink and put a pretty good ding in it right there. You've also got one right down here, a rather small one right here. And then this thing got kind of chewed up around the edges here, especially right here. You never see this while playing. I'm not entirely too sure how this happens, but it is there. The finish is worn through, but that is definitely the worst condition wise on this guitar. Besides that, all your hardware and stuff is stock and ready to go. Back of the headstock, serial number 80829744. Now, if you look along the edges, you've got a few nicks and dings here, as well as up and around here. But most importantly to note is you've got some stand rash where it's kind of turned a slightly more yellow color. And if you look at this side, you can see some of the clear coat kind of chipped from that as well. Back of the neck is in good shape. There's just a very slight impression mark right here. But other than that, you only have like a tiny ding right up here on the heel. It's kind of right there. And as always, you can see where the neck meets the body. That line is just kind of apparent, but that is very common. It is not a break, crack, or repair. The back of the instrument, it doesn't really have any buckle worming or buckle rash to speak of, but you do have some more light nicks and dings, kind of like right here. There's a small like, little finish check line there. And you can see a bunch more impression marks kind of along the edges right there as well as along this dinged up side once again. You're gonna notice that the back cavity plate here still has the original plastic over it. I would kind of just suggest leaving it on because usually if the plastic has been on for this extended period of time, it looks funny when you take it off, but it is bubbling a little bit there. We'll take a quick look around the edges here. Kind of the same story as the rest of this guitar. I mean, it displays really well, but once you actually start looking at this condition, it's like, oh, well, maybe it's just in good condition and not excellent after all. So quite a few nicks and dings on this instrument, some of which do break the finish as we were talking about earlier. But we will go ahead and view this under black light. Here we can see everything is glowing really nicely on the top. It glows a little bit more here because, you know, somebody's sweaty arm. I guess while we're here, sometimes this knob will fall off. I kind of tightened up the fit a little bit so it's not as loose, but just wanted to let you know. Look at the back of the instrument here. Everything's glowing the way I would expect to see. Take a quick look around the edges as well. Back of the neck, obviously it glows a little bit more because of somebody's sweat has absorbed into the neck. But it looks like we are free from breaks, cracks, and repairs on this example. It is a beautiful one. This instrument does still retain its original Gibson USA case. This is kind of the first time when they start getting used. You can see it's got scratches, nicks and dings all over the outside Tolex, but you know, that's just because it was stored in a collection and was probably lightly gigged even before that. But you have two locking combo locks as well as two regular latches and a really nice handle. Now I'm not sure what these little square tabs are that surround the lock. Sometimes that makes it hard to open but they are on both of them. The inside is pink and it is form fit exactly to this guitar, so it won't fit anything else. You do still have the pink blanket case shroud, but it's come unattached. So I just kind of use it as headstock support at this point in time. And you can also see that your lid ribbon has come undone. Inside the case compartment, you've got a little bit of case candy paperwork. It just tells you about the locking latches though. If you think you might be interested in being the next owner of this Gibson Explorer E90 Double, feel free to check out that link in the description that will take you to the Reverb for Sale ad. Thank you Troglodytes for watching, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.